previously on the Seegers family Edifice Venture. We made a trip to the Habitat for Humanity Restore to do a little window shopping, and Penny made a startling discovery about the pink oven that she wanted so badly. It's not here! <laughs> you sell it? You sold it? Yes. Soon after, the window shopping turned into doors, cabinets, and siding shopping. We got this. At a salvage yard, they, were, they sold it for $2 a point. Things then got a little on the goofy side, with Koi trying to hitch a ride on the trailer. Can I please have a ride that you not hold on to? I went into a can-smashing frenzy. It's the new can-smashing over And the boys? Well, they were just being boys. We thought we corrected the excessive rafter span by putting up an extra beam and post. Even though the beam and posts were not to 100% satisfaction to the inspector, he did give us the green light to finish the roof and side the outside of the greenhouse. We then moved to the kitchen and added extra support to the roof by adding collar ties, plus we were able to finish the kitchen subfloor and get it ready for tiling. At the end of the last episode, I had just returned from two weeks of Army training at Camp Maybury, Texas and a week-long National Skills USA competition in Kansas City, Missouri. This gave me time to recover from major surgery, however, I still had some restrictions, so Warren finished the subfloor in the kitchen pretty much on his own. In this episode, we make a push towards some major milestones such as tiling, shoring up the building, framing several rooms, and installing the main entry and patio doors. When our project receives a jolt, literally with the electrical line installation, we see major physical changes to the interior of the building. If you like our podcast, you'll love our website. Check it out at edificeventure.com. See pictures, read blogs, find cool links, and get information on green products and services. Well, we got four kids, a cat, and a dog, and we're looking for an open space where we can stretch our legs and start a new life and build us a greener place. Structure stood with no inner walls and a big hole in the roof. And now it's hard to build the American dream, and brother, this is living proof. A giant labor of love is falling down on County Road 1. But with TLC and nature's harmony, we can keep it from a coming undone. is sponsored in part by Habitat for Humanity of Elkhart County, building decent affordable housing with people in need, WVPE 88.1, a NPR station, inform, entertain, inspire, Anco Products Incorporated, our energy saves you energy, and Heritage Antique Lumber, crafting fine furniture, custom cabinetry, and trim using lumber from historic barns. We last left off on July 2nd, 2008. We finished the subfloor in the kitchen and we were itching to put some tile down. This would be the first time that we had ever done any tile work ourselves. So even before we attempted to do the job, we did a little research on the internet of how to best get the job done. To let you know what we found, we now bring you Tile Tips with Penny Seegers, a short program on important information on the proper procedures of floor tiling. Penny Seegers is not a professional tile installer. We recommend that you conduct your own research before attempting any tile work on your own. Welcome to Tile Tips with myself, Penny Seegers. Ceramic tile floors are attractive and very durable when compared to other floor finishes. Ceramic tiles come in many shapes, sizes, colors, and even designs. When installed properly, ceramic tile floors can last for many years and believe it or not, they are fairly easy to install. Here are the basic steps we followed while installing the tiles to the floor. Step 1. Prep the room. Make sure the subfloor is sturdy with a suitable substrate. It is not a good idea to install tiles over cushioned vinyl flooring, chip or particle board, OSB, 
tongue and groove planking or hardwood floors. The subfloor should consist of double layered plywood as we demonstrated in episode six. Make sure you remove objects that may obstruct the tile installation, like baseboards and even the toilet if working in a bathroom. Step two, find the center of the room by snapping a chalk line half the distance of the width and length. Step three, dry fit your tiles. Start from the middle and work to the outer edges. You should have equal border space completely around the room. If you find the border is not equal on one or more sides, you can shift the tile pattern during the installation to compensate. Step four, adhere the tile to the floor using an adhesive for ceramic tiles. Work from the center of the room to the outer edges. You can apply the adhesive directly to the floor or to the tiles. Both methods are acceptable. Being the first time we ever tiled a floor, we chose to apply the adhesive directly to the tiles. This method is often referred to as back buttering. Back buttering allows a little more time to set the tiles properly. Be sure to use spacers. Spacers will ensure even distance between the tiles and straight grout lines. Well, that does it for this edition of Tile Tips with Penny. Next time, we'll show you how to cut border tiles and how to apply grout. Thanks, Penny. Continuing on with our story, it was July 2nd, 2008, and we should have been on our way to Vincennes, Indiana to the in-laws to celebrate the 4th, but we were anxious to see how the tiles would look. The small tiles we got for free. They were scrap tiles that were given to us by various people. One man's trash is another man's kitchen floor. These tiles did cause a small problem though. Not all of them are exactly the same size, so sometimes, like this one, we have to fudge a little bit and kind of move it around. The gap is slightly bigger, but I think that adds to the character of the floor so it's not so perfect. It almost has an eclectic look to it. The larger tiles were a closeout. We paid around 69 cents per tile. If you have ever priced out 16 inch tiles, you know that is a deal. At about 2 a.m. we had enough tile down for us to get a real good picture of what the floor would look like when finished. It was time to quit, take a short nap, and make the five-hour trip to Vincennes, Indiana for the 4th of July festivities. July 9th, 2008. We went back to work on the tile floor after the summer holiday, and with the help of the kids, I was able to knock a good portion of the floor out. One here. Yeah, and one there. I got it. Yeah, good job. Three. I got it. Yeah, good job. Did you notice I said we knocked a good portion of the kitchen floor out? It would take some time to completely tile the 20 by 14 foot room. All right, enough about tiles. I love you, everybody. I love you. July 11, 2008. We removed the old vents from the kitchen. When we put the steel roof on, we fitted the peaks with ridge vents, which made the old vents in the building obsolete. Plus, the vents were access points for the flying squirrels. And yes, they returned for another summer. See the little mess is up there, then. Besides closing up the vent in the kitchen, we also started to prep the breaker box for the service line. Yes, electricity was on the way, which meant that old, loud, gas, guzzling, inefficient generator was on its way out. July 14, 2008. Penny's parents came up from Vincent's Indiana for Jory's confirmation. After the open house, we all headed out to the building to give her parents, Fred and Donna, a tour. While we were there, Fred answered some of the questions I had concerning the installation of the electric meter and breaker box. Meantime, I had Jory's boyfriend, Stephen Kilmer, put in the lightning rods and ground wire with Josh Cruz. Josh is the boyfriend of my niece, Diamond Kelly. Funny how a tour of the building turns into work for the boyfriends. With a project this size, you have to use the additional help when available. July 15, 2008. Jim Hagen, my cousin, and I put in the meter box. First, we had to cut a hole through the wall where the conduit would connect the meter box with the breaker box. Then we had to dig a short trench for the conduit in which the service line would enter from the ground and run up to the meter. Of course, just like any project we have done to date, there would be a wrench in the works to slow us down. First, the shower that we planned to make a small garden pond out of was in the path of the service line slated to be buried from the pole to the meter. So we had to dig it up and move it. It didn't seem like a big issue, but it was. 
The shower had settled firmly into the ground and water in it to add weight. It was funny watching Jim showing his gracefulness in the process of removing it. This breaks, I'm scared. In time, we were able to pry the shower out of the ground enough to pull it out with the truck. Then we found the pipe to nowhere. It too was in the way of the service line that would be buried. It took us some time to dig it out also. It actually did go somewhere though. I always wondered where that hole led to. Now I know. Once we had all the obstructions moved, we were able to finish the trench, install the conduit, meter box, and breaker box. A few days later, our work was cleared by the inspector and ready for the power company to put in a service line. Stay tuned to the Seegers Family Edifice Venture. Up next, we notice the house is visibly bulging out of one end. Since the early 1960s, Texture Fine Insulation has been an environmentally friendly product. Our unique process diverts millions of pounds of fiberglass scrap from landfills each year. Today, high quality standards have made Anko Products a world class industry leader in high tensile strength, resilient insulation products. Anko Products include laminated metal building insulation, insulated flexible duct system, and indoor air quality, Green Guard certified Texture Fine Insulation. Green isn't a new initiative, we started in the 60s. Anko Products, our energy saves you energy. Ertugentic Lumber is a small, family-run business. We reclaim lumber and we turn it into something you can be proud of and you will be happy with. The uniqueness of our cabinetry is one of a kind. Ertugentic Lumber makes furniture, crafts, mirrors, frames, and more using reclaimed barn wood. We at Ertugentic Lumber consider ourselves more than just craftsmen. We are also artists. Visit our website and see our quality. HeritageAntiqueLumber.com July 17, 2008 It was the eve of a special day for the twins. When's your birthday? Tomorrow. How old will you be? Six. Six years old? Yes. How many years is that? Trick question, six. Besides the birthday celebration, we were also excited to start framing the main living area. But again, something stood in the way of doing that. Fellow Career Center teacher and friend Pete Pika came over to give me a hand with a bulging wall. Well, Warren and I, we noticed that there's a bow in the outside wall, so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to try to cable that back in so he doesn't have problems with his siding and everything, and, and also his uh, square for his walls inside his house. So there's always something new with an old house, you know, so we have a lot of work to do with that. But we're basically gonna use a come along couple of come-alongs and we're gonna basically mount it to the floor and try to pull that bowl back in to straighten the house out. But before we could pull the wall back to its plumb position, we had to do a little demo to remove some framing not original to the building that would hamper us from moving the wall in. After the demo, I cut holes to the plank sheathing so that we could tie the come-alongs around a solid portion of the framing. With all the prep work complete, I wondered how much did the wall need to come in? two inches or more above, up, up top on the sills and then down here. Uh, it's, it's that far out of level, it's about two inches out of level. Two inches may not seem like a lot normally, but when it comes to pulling in a wall, it's quite a bit. So we hooked up the come-alongs and started ratcheting the wall back into place. Oh, the sound of tension. <laughs> yes, the wall creaked and groaned as we pulled it in. After a few good ratchets, we put a level to it. Almost there. With a few more pulls of the ratchet, the wall was no longer vertically challenged. Well, almost. We are level there on that point with the, with the, uh, uh, the cable. We cable this one and that's level, but for some reason this is, this is not, and I figured out why. When I looked up, I forgot about this big board up here. It is now bowed, so it has a ton of pressure on it. We're going to have to get up there, bang it out. The whole wall ought to just line up just nicely. Pete was right. After I relieved the tension from the board, things straightened up. We then put up a few braces until the new walls went in and called it a day. We were now ready to start framing the main floor. Here's a look at the building layout before we started the framing. Of course, the kitchen was already framed out. There were no existing walls on any floor level, so we pretty much had a clean canvas to work with. The overall floor space is 60 feet by 40 feet. 
At the time when we started the framing, the stairs in the upper right hand corner led to the basement and main entry door. The stairs shown in the bottom right hand corner led to the basement also. The French doors were already installed, but the deck the doors would lead to was not built yet. Through the countless drawings and hundreds of suggestions from different people, this is the layout we came up with. The main floor will consist of a dining room, living room, home theater, study, half bath and closet, a foyer in the main entrance with a walk-in closet, and a bar heading the entertainment room. This area would become a staircase to the next floor. Yes, we had our work cut out for us. The good thing is we had stockpiled enough wood to frame the entire floor. Next on the Seegers Family Edifice Venture, it's a fast-paced frame-a-thon. 88.1 WVPE Public Radio is a vital communication resource that strives to inform, entertain, and inspire. National Public Radio is an internationally acclaimed producer and distributor of non-commercial news, talk, and entertainment programming. WVPE serves local listeners with a distinctive blend of national and local programming and annual events. In 2008, WVPE launched a sustainability initiative which includes green events and programs. Learn more at WVPE.org. It is July 25th, 2008, and we are out here today working on the building. What we're going to be putting up is some of the walls for the living room and the dining room and the hallway that is going to the uh, deck doors. Okay, everything I just said, wishful thinking. We didn't even get one room framed out, and the framing book would not have the answers to the problems we would encounter. First, the wood was warped and slowed us down, until I invented the twister a tool that would help bend the studs back into place. Second, the outside walls were 93 and one half inches tall. The bottom of the first intersecting truss to our new wall, 91 and 3 4 inches. That meant the truss was sagging 1 and 1 4 inches lower than the outside walls. Yes, we would have to raise the truss in order for the walls to fit. Since we didn't have anything on hand to jack the truss up, we left the additional top plate off and use the persuader to put the wall in upright to finish the day. July 26, 2008. Penny, Jim, and myself kicked off another day with some demo. It's one of my favorite things to do, but sometimes I do get a little carried away. That's Warren's handiwork. All right, this is gonna be the second wall that we're gonna put up. This will completely box in the living room. Take a look. After we secured the two walls together, we jacked up the truss enough to fit the cap plate in. For those of you that are not versed in framing terminology, here is a descriptive look at the innards of a wall. Innards? Is that a word? Well, anyway, what I'm trying to say is, here's how a wall is constructed. All walls have a bottom and top plate. The top plate must be doubled if it is a load-bearing wall. The cap plate goes over the top plate and helps to tie walls and partitions together. The studs that run from the bottom plate to the top plate are called the king studs. Headers support the wall load above windows and doors. Trimmer studs support the headers. Sill plates are found at the bottom of window rough openings. Cripple studs run from the bottom plate to the sill plate or from the top of a header to the top plate. And now you are versed on the innards of a wall. July 27, 2008. The entire family was working like a fine oiled machine. The boys helped me mark the stud placement while Penny measured and marked all the studs for me to cut. Then the kids moved the wood into place after I cut the studs to length. In no time at all, we had another wall ready to go up. July 28, 2008. Our service line into the house was installed. We now had electricity, which did have its benefits. On the environmental side, we no longer had to rely on a gas-operated generator to power the tools. On the side of progress, we were now able to run more than one tool at once. This was a huge time saver. As the workers went about their business, the kids watched in amazement. Penny and I also observed with intrigue. And Zane took it upon himself to make sure things were getting done right as he thumbed through a wiring book nearby. 
Later that day, Pete Pika and his son Colin came over to help put in the front door. Putting the front door in required demo, and this time the demo would require knocking a hole through the wall. Or not. So how many hits does it take with a sledgehammer to knock a wall loose? One, two, three, four, five. Five hits. There's a hole in your wall. By the way, the door was free. It was given to us from fellow teacher Ryan Gortney, who moved the entrance to the house he was working on. The new entrance on his house was smaller and the door no longer fit. Putting the door in our building instead of the landfill is called material reclamation. It is July 29th and we are going to put together the first wall for the home theater system. Ready to do it? All right, here we go. On July 30th, 2008, we finished the framing of the home theater. Hey, hang out with us a little longer. When we return, I'll let you know what to expect in our next show. The Sagers Family Oedipus Venture is sponsored in part by Habitat for Humanity of Elkhart County, building decent, affordable housing with people in need. WVPE 88.1, a NPR station. Inform, entertain, inspire. Anco Products Incorporated, our energy saves you energy. And Heritage Antique Lumber, crafting fine furniture, custom cabinetry, and trim using lumber from historic barns. If you like our video series, you'll love our website. Check it out at www.edificeventure.com. See pictures, read blogs, find cool links, plus information and tips to help you get started on your own green sustainable home improvement projects. Next time on the Seegers Family Edifice Venture, we find out flying squirrels are not the only airborne critter living in the building. We put more siding up, frame more rooms out, and start working on the third floor. Plus, we find a company that produces recycled insulation. How sustainable is that?